and today I'm, as Chris said, going to be presenting part of our project, Expense Tenants to Investment, How the Welfare State Supports EU Migrant Economic Achievements. Um, so this was, uh, I mean we started this really quite recently in the last few months and the reason we did this was um, to sort of contribute to the Brexit debate. So we kind of started this at the, you know, came up with the ideas at the end of the last year, kind of really started January, February time and then we, we've kind of gone from there. And the purpose was to kind of have a contribution from a policy perspective. Uh, so I'm a research assistant here in social policy at the Centre for Population Change. I'm also a student, so um, if I'm uh, out of time with my timings here, I hope you'll forgive me for my inexperience. But, um, anyway, so just a bit of an overview of what I'm going to go through. I'm going to start by just talking about uh, the kind of problem that we're going to address, or what we're looking to talk about, what we're looking to um, contribute to. And I'm going to begin by examining how, at the political level and the general public level in the UK, we look at the issue of benefits uh, for EU migrants. And I'm going to make the argument that um, this is kind of disconnected from the reality. We argue that they are actually a burden, um, but the statistics suggest that they actually want to be reductive. So uh, there's this kind of difference here. And I'm going to say that the various implications for this, and we're going to come at this from uh, a kind of a perspective that's good for Britain. We're going to say, well, is it really good to frame it as a burden? Does, is it really good for us, or does it make more sense for us to look at EU migrant benefits in a different way? And I'm going to talk about looking at social policy for EU migrants in, in, through the eyes of investment. I'm going to say, well, actually, maybe if we look at social policy, it's kind of the oil that keeps the machine going, that helps migrants move on and be productive. As um, Russell kind of mentioned earlier, you know, any job, better job, you know, fantastic job. You know, we can um, uh, maybe that's more beneficial in the long run for the UK economy. So to begin, are migrant benefits a The political debate here in the UK, um, whether or not EU migrants should be eligible to receive British benefits, has long been a very controversial uh, topic in Britain's membership debate. Uh, I think the general argument, which is forwarded by people who are in favour of a Brexit, tends to be that. Uh, this EU migrant is coming over to Britain and is proving to be a burden on an already overstretched healthcare system, housing system, and social security system in general. And statements like these uh, from high-level politicians, you know, they're commonplace. We've seen them so many times in the past few years, and they're not surprised at all. And whole sections of the press, you know, these kind of headlines are not surprising. This one's from three years ago, and we're still seeing the same kind of thing today. And it's such an important issue, it's such a, um, a high-level issue, that when David Cameron began the renegotiation of Britain's place in Europe last year, he actually used the draw that our welfare system exerts across Europe as one of his primary justifications for needing to bring about change. So really, it's not that surprising that public opinion in the UK uh, kind of matches these sentiments. Various opinion polls have shown that people here are in favour of restricting the benefits that EU migrants um, can apply for. Not only that, um, I remember seeing one quite recently where uh, the majority of the British public believed a significant proportion, something like 20% of EU migrants were unemployed and were actually living off of benefits. And this chart here shows this is for all migrants, not just EU migrants, but the public are in favour of actually extending the residency requirements for eligibility. So making it so that migrants have to live here in Britain for longer before they can become eligible for any benefits at all. So this is interesting. So migrant benefits is a burden. I kind of thought, well, you know, how much truth is there here? And I thought, well, the way to answer this question, the way to see how much truth is there behind these statements, is to look at who EU migrants actually are. So what do the statistics tell us? Well, a recent analysis here in the uh, CPC, actually as part of the same kind of project, uh, of 2011 census data, showed that the majority of EU migrants were of working age. I think about 69% were of working age. And this is compared to uh, about 50% of the UK native population. The majority of them were in work. I think 64% um, were working. Um, and you know, this is again reflected in the survey results we saw earlier this morning where 69% of them were employed. Um, and not only that, but they were quite well educated. In fact, I think it was just under a third of EU migrants had a degree. I think it was about 32%, I think. And again, this is higher than the corresponding figures for British nationals. Uh, and other data, data from the International Passenger Survey, shows that the main reason uh, for EU migrants, what they declare as their reason for coming to the UK, is usually to work. So this is all of the EU on the far end, and this is various groups of countries. Um, but these two columns here show the percentage that come for work-related reasons, either because they want to find a job once they arrive, or because they have a job before they come. Uh, and the two other biggest um, sections are accompanying other people or studying. 
So we're looking at a, a group of people. The, the characteristics of these people seem to be that they're young, well qualified, that they are coming in search of work. And it's not surprising that there has been um, quite a bit of research which has suggested uh, that they actually are a positive, they do make a positive contribution. Um, we all remember, I think it hit headlines uh, pretty big three years ago, the paper from UCL which suggested that they pay more in taxes than they take out from the social security system. So I kind of thought, well, where is the evidence for the fact that they are a burden? Where is that coming from? Um, I just put this in here because I thought this was quite interesting. Uh, Neil Kinnock submitted a written question to Parliament where he said, can you please give me all the information that you have that EU migrants are coming because of have been working out of work benefits here in the UK. And the response said that between 37% and 45% of EU households are being supported by the benefit system. And this might ring a bell with some of you because this has been used various times before. The Prime Minister has claimed 43% of uh, EU migrant households are uh, living off the benefit system. But these figures don't actually answer that question. This includes EU migrants who are in work and they're receiving in work benefits. It includes EU migrants who have actually retired and are receiving pensions. So it's not actually saying well, these people are here to be a burden. Uh, and again, earlier this year, Lord Beecham asked for something very similar for data on the number of taxes or the amount of taxes that have been paid and um, uh, against what has been claimed. And the response said the information is not available. So we kind of have this um, very clear disparity here, and I found it really interesting. So we have this idea that, which has taken hold in the public debate, that um, uh, EU migrants are a burden, and this is, you know, on the welfare state, they shouldn't be allowed to claim social policy, and we have the reality where it looks as if, you know, this doesn't really fit the profile, it looks as if they, EU migrants, generally speaking, want to come to work, uh, and that they're quite well qualified. So, I kind of thought, well, yeah, alright, well, what's the implication of this? What does it actually matter too much if people just think, oh, they're a burden, but they're not? Well, one of the reasons it's quite important is because because of this burden narrative, policymakers have actually responded to it by uh, removing social rights of EU migrants. So we can say that before this started happening, um, in terms of benefits, you know, they had good support, which is relatively on par uh, with what UK nationals were eligible to claim in terms of social security, right? Uh, and then from 2014 in particular, uh, a series of restrictions have actually been introduced to make it harder for EU migrants in the UK to start claiming benefits. These include a um, three month wait for unemployed EU migrants before they can claim anything. It has to be within the common travel area. It's the UK, Ireland, Isle of Man. Um, it also includes removing benefits for unemployed EU migrants, including housing benefit, council tax benefit. It uh, includes putting on a uh, time limit, uh, a shorter time limit for what, for how much they, uh, for what they can uh, claim when they're unemployed. And this at first was moved down from, it started at six months, then it went down to three months. So at the moment it's about 91 days. Uh, and also, it's now more difficult to be considered a worker in the UK. If you're working, you have to go through several tests to have your work measured as, to, to see whether it's genuine and effective. And if it is, then you are eligible to uh, apply for in-work benefits. And now they've introduced minimum earnings thresholds uh, and then further tests to determine um, whether work can be considered genuine and effective. And on top of that, as we all know, as part of the um, renegotiation, which um, was announced a few months ago, there is now the option for a new emergency break. The UK government can freeze all in-work and out-of-work benefits for EU migrants in the UK. Uh, and they do this, um, I think, seven years, and over that period, they start to gradually build up their entitlement again, but at the moment, it's not actually known how that would work. So we kind of have these two um, sort of different sets of systems, different sets of rights for EU migrants in a relatively short space of time. And um, because we're here, and it's the spectrum of Brexit, there is the possibility for a third. Uh, the future, what happens next week, we'll know what happens if we do leave. You know, there could, there could be uh, even greater restrictions. Let's say that the current uh, system for non-EU migrants is extended to include EU migrants. And essentially what that means is there will be no eligibility to receive any social security at all. Uh, access to the UK will only be granted with the condition that there is no recourse to public funds, which includes various benefits, such as job seekers allowance, income support, child benefit, that kind of thing. So, I kind of thought, well, this is interesting. So we have these three different systems, and the reason that we're in the middle one at the moment, the reason we have that reform system is because this whole uh, burden narrative has really taken hold. And I kind of thought, well, we can look at Social Security as, as a burden. We can look at it as a cost that if we stop paying it, we'll suddenly have more money back in the public purse. But there is also another way to look at it. And this is kind of what we wanted to do. And this is how we wanted to contribute to the debate. Maybe there is a different way to look at what we pay to EU migrants. And that is 
Well, the problem is, does restricting support for a group of people who want to be productive make it harder for them to succeed? So knowing that they do actually want to um, do something that contributes to the UK economy, that they're not just here to be a burden, does the fact that we're restricting rights make that more difficult for them? So that's important because we're now looking at it as an investment social policy because in the long run, if we can help them contribute, that's actually going to be a payoff for us. So we're not looking necessarily at the welfare state as just a safety net that catches people who are no longer eligible to, or sorry, able to um, extract away from the market. And instead, we're kind of giving it a productive role. We're saying, okay, it should help people uh, cultivate human capital. It should help them get that um, uh, dream job that they want. It should help them, you know, be able to respond to new social risks, which um, are more common in the modern economy, such as, um, you know. Uh, uh, unusual working patterns, temporary contracts, new, uh, new family structures, that kind of thing. And the idea is that if we can do this, well, we can, we can actually benefit from productive individuals in the long run. So actually it benefits the UK economy uh, overall. So not just looking at this from a, oh, well, it makes it harder for EU migrants perspective, but actually, is it good for us? So as I said, we're really early in this. We've only been doing it for a few months um, and we thought, well, you know, how can we actually show this? How can we show this uh, uh, that this could actually make it difficult for certain migrants, which could be bad for us? So we took a kind of simulation approach. We took all these um, uh, regulations, we took the different rules and eligibility requirements, and we wanted to see how, under different characteristics um, for different EU migrants, how does actual monetary entitlements change between the three systems that I mentioned, so the pre-reform, the reforms and the Brexit. How does the money, how, how does what they can get in monetary terms actually change in those three systems? And I thought, okay, well, why don't we have these migrants with different characteristics and see what they can get if they then run into trouble? Let's say if they are struggling to contribute in the UK, let's say if, if they can't find a job or something like that, then what can they get in these three systems? And is it enough to help them? And to make that judgment to see if, if what they would get is enough to help them and keep them going, if you don't follow me at the moment, it will hopefully become clearer in a few minutes. Um, to, to, um, we've compared the amount that they can get to a poverty line. And this is based on the 50% of the average wage in the UK. Uh, and then it's adjusted using, um, it, we've adjusted it to the household composition um, for each individual migrant. And to bring this argument to life and to make it kind of um, accessible and, and to, to, to kind of make it feel real, we've, we've kind of, we've, displayed it as biographies. We've, we've given stories to these migrants, these different characteristics that we've, given, uh, that we've, uh, that we've tested. And the purpose is um, these biographies aren't just made up, but they're based on the statistical data uh, that we have about migrants. So these are about young people from, who are educated and that kind of thing. And I really am running out of time, so I'm very sorry. So we have a whole range, thank God. I'm only presenting three here <laughs> because I would be here all day. But okay, so biography one. We call him Peter and he's a graduate job seeker. Um, he's from Poland, he's 24, and he's single, so he comes over by himself, uh, and he's educated at degree level, okay? So he has a degree in computer science, and his, uh, his dream, his dream job is to um, get a job in software development in Britain. And he wants to build a career here and stay here for a long time. Um, so what happens after he arrives? Well, stage of his UK journey. First, he does a graduate internship. It was never meant to be permanent, but it looks good in the CV. He's here. Um, not earning that much money, but he's here for a while doing this, and then he can move on to maybe something more permanent. But let's say he struggles. Uh, he can only find intermittent IT work once this graduate internship finishes. So let's say it's in a college. Uh, and this, you know, he's not getting many hours, he's not earning much, but he's able to search for a job while he's doing this. And then after this intermittent work comes to an end, let's just say the college hits summer and they don't need anyone on the IT desk anymore because the students aren't here, um, he is made unemployed. So he needs help. From, he needs some sort of support to help him as he looks for a job. And let's see what, how that would change under the three different systems. So his poverty line is set to £1,016. Uh, in the pre-reform system, he would this would be his housing benefit and council tax benefit entitlement. And he then get a further £250 in jobs he allowance. So he falls just below his poverty line. He falls £46 below his poverty line. Um, but you know he's close to it and he's a young single person he's by himself you know it's quite reasonable to expect that yeah okay he'd probably get by for a limited amount of time like this as he looks for another job and finds something more permanent okay so he's received enough support to be able to stay in the uk and then hopefully in the long run to be able to to be productive to contribute what about in the reform scenario well he's received 250 pounds in job seekers allowance 
and then that's it. He falls, he only gets about 25% of what he needs in order to beat his relative poverty line, or in order to meet his relative poverty line. Um, and in Brexit scenario, as he has no recourse to public funds, he gets nothing. And his deficit is the entire poverty line. Um, so, in, I mean, in the latter two scenarios, it's very difficult to imagine that it would be easy for him to actually stay here, to keep hunting for a job, uh, and to, in the long run, be productive. And I will hurry up a little bit. Uh, Maria is our second one. Um, and we've called this from periphery to the core, and the purpose being uh, is that she wants to come and train to be a NAS. She wants to start without the relative, relevant qualifications to um, be a NAS, and then, while in the UK, make that decision, take that risk and train, and then see if she can um, uh, get the job that she wants. Uh, she's from Romania, she's 30, she's a single mother of a five-year-old child, and she has mid-range education. She's got secondary level qualifications, so again, she's quite well educated. Um, she comes to the UK, and she's settling in, and she gets a job as a care worker. She doesn't immediately train, she works there for, as a care worker for 18 months. She's earning just over £1,000 a month, so she's able to top up her wages with benefits, um, or she's able to uh, claim social security while she works. Um, and then after these 18 months, she makes a decision, OK, I'm going to take this risk, I'm going to take this cut in wages, I'm going to not work as much, and I'm going to um, uh, train to become a nurse. So what financial position would she be in after those 18 months? So part of this investment that we were talking about, um, which really I should have mentioned earlier, is the idea that it gives you security. And it gives you security to, um, to actually fulfil your aims, to do what you want, to be productive. So after 18 months, will she be in a secure enough position to take that risk? Well, her poverty line is set to 1,300. In the pre-reform system, she obviously gets her wages, uh, she gets child benefit, she gets housing and council tax benefit, and then she gets tax credit. So she's taken above uh, the poverty line. She's taken quite comfortably above it. She is um, probably able to save during this period. Uh, and you know, she's in a relatively secure position at the end of the 18 months. You can say, OK, yeah, I'll take this risk. I've, I've been OK here. I'm settled in. I can do this. I can go and train a BMS. And the reform scenario, well, the reason we picked this one was to show uh, how the new um, restrictions that uh, can actually be quite uh, alarming from an investment perspective. So we look at this emergency break. All benefits for, uh, for new EU migrants could be frozen. So in that case, she would get her wage. Then over time, her entitlement would very gradually build, but there's no um, uh, actual mechanism to work that out at the moment. So you know, you make an estimation. But then what we do know is that she would fall below, in those 18 months, below the poverty line. So she'd be in a much less secure position to train to become a nurse. And in that way, we've kind of lost out. The UK economy has kind of lost out on her productive potential. And in the Brexit scenario, she has her wage, and again, she is below the poverty line because she does not have any entitlement to benefits. Um, I think I've actually completely run out of time, so I'll just go very quickly. The final one was uh, the entrepreneur. Um, he is from Portugal, he's 32, he has a wife and two young kids, and he's educated to degree level, um, and he wants to come and set up a business in the UK doing something that um, uh, the British public would absolutely love. He wants to import some wine, and he sets it up somewhere in the Midlands. And in the early stages, it's, it's quite difficult. He, he's surviving with it. He's taking a low wage in his business. Um, his wife is working part-time, and he's able to claim child benefits to top up his income. Um, and he wants to expand. He wants to expand in order to, um, to increase his profits, to increase profitability of his business. Uh, so what options are available to him? He wants to apply to public funding schemes. Well, his property line is 2,134. So let's say he takes a wage where it just basically brings him up to it and he's able to claim child benefit on top of that and have a very small kind of uh, deficit there. So pre-reform and reform scenarios, the situations are quite similar and he is eligible to apply for various public funding schemes and let's say he applies for 50k and he gets it. And he's able to expand his business, he's able to stay, he's able to keep his business going and uh, eventually turn over a much better profit and therefore contribute. Um, however, in a Brexit scenario, he loses his entitlement to apply for that funding. And he falls slightly further below the poverty line, but the important part is he isn't able to expand his business in the way that he wants to. So just rushing through these last things. So what the point of this is to say that for the future for these uh, three different migrants is they could go somewhere else. They could go somewhere else where they have more social rights, where it's easier for them to keep going, where it's easier for them to make the contribution that they want to make and be productive. Uh, and it's the UK economy could lose out in the long run. So it's not necessarily looking at it just as a burden, but if we look at it as an investment, it's also something which is good for us. And I have taken about 
10 minutes more than I meant to, I think. But just to a Okay, okay, that's up to you then.